welcome back to Supercoach Edge. Well, Liam, we've seen the back of round two, which means we head into round three, where the pressure gauge is dialed up in Supercoach with players in the bubble, meaning it's the last chance to correct your team and jump on the hottest cash cows and primos before price changes. It is excited. Mm, and it is we, exciting time. It's exciting. It's exciting, but it's also the worst time because you want to make sure you're jumping on the right players. Stressful. Um, yes, yeah, stressful is the right word. Of course, we have already seen some players uh, from round zero, obviously changing price over the weekend, having played their third game. But as you said, it does mean on the trade front, it's arguably probably the most important round of the season to probably set up your team and make last corrections um, if need be before we see these prices increase uh, or decrease potentially. We'll cover all of the potential changes you could make in today's episode. But before we do get stuck into things, let's, of course, have a look at our socials and where you can find us on YouTube. Just search Supercoach Edge and don't forget to subscribe to make sure you're notified of when our content does drop from week to week with team reveals or team review, sorry, episodes, uh, our main episodes, all that kind of stuff. On Twitter at, at supercoach underscore edge, Damon at, at damaj 88 myself at, at Liam Evans underscore 95, and Facebook and Insta, search Supercoach Edge, and you'll find us there. Very nice. We'll, uh, We'll briefly outline our team's performances and scores for the purposes of our much uh, anticipated, of course, making its return to 2024, our head-to-head competition that we have between us, Liam. But as we pointed out last week, and you alluded to there, this season we're rolling with our own individual team talk episodes that delve into our own teams in greater detail, which of course, covers analysis into our strategies, discussing the trades we'll be making and reviewing our teams more comprehensively. So make sure to subscribe on YouTube so you get notified of when they drop. But uh, we'll start off with my score and how my team fared. So I ended up scoring a not too bad uh, performance, I guess, for the week with a score of 2073, uh, which is pretty good considering obviously best 18 and finished with a ranking lamb. I'm inside the top 10K. Ooh, it's uncharted territory for a, for a fair while, I think, um, but uh, to be this high up anyway so early on. So I sit ranked 9,678th overall, which is up 20K odd spots. So absolutely incredible there. Very nice. And um, I guess for context, I was ranked 47,491st in round two last season. So happy to say that I'm maybe still in the running maybe for the top prize, um, but I uh, ended up finishing 981st in the end of 2023. So hopefully that means that I can make the same climb in ranks to sit in potentially the Iron Throne come the end of the 2024 season. Fingers crossed. But um, just sort of rounding off my uh, my trade-ins, I won't go into too much depth, of course, but my early trade-in of Massimo D'Ambrosio, that paid off well with a score of 87, whilst my risk picks, again, pay dividends in the form of Heaney and Jacko uh, scoring respectively 178 and 128. And also, if you haven't already, make sure to tune in to my team review video that's currently on YouTube. Uh, try and upload them every Monday. So um, look out for those ahead of, of course, our official uh, weekly episodes, which will give, of course, a complete look at who performed, who didn't, and, of course, my trade plans heading in to round three. Now, Liam, how did you fare? Yes. Uh, in terms of my score, not quite as high as yours. I did score 1986, though, so not too bad. Uh, and did increase my ranking to almost 22,000 spots up to 60,772 overall. So a nice right. little climb there. feels good, though, but still not too happy. Um, I think my t- score and the team that I fielded could have been better. Uh, played some rookie roulette, unfortunately. But, uh, yep, them's the breaks mm. at this stage of the season particularly. <laughs> we'll chat through my plans in my team episode, though, which will be released later this week. But yeah, let's just jump straight into the head-to-head, Damon. Do you want to do us the do us the honors? Is that the word? I don't know. Yep, that'll, that'll do. I'll, I'll do us the honors. I'll do us both the honors because uh, I was a happy camper. Did end up getting my second win. Yes, two from two thus far, but uh, looking good. And the differential between us is two hundred and ten points. So as I've said last year, and it will be a recurring theme uh, in the early stages anyway. Until you, of course, you inevitably come back, Liam and trounce me, which could be this week. You know, it's it's a long season, long, long season. So now, Liam, let's jump straight into our super coach wide, good, the bad, and the ugly. (laughs) 
So let's kick it off with the good, of course, and it is Luke Jackson. And he went bang, absolutely bang on the weekend with a score of 178. The highest for the round, absolutely smashing up uh, North Melbourne and um, it was incredible. He um, he just did it all around the ground. You know, he's that sort of player. And we're just hoping as well. I mean, obviously, as an owner, I'm hoping. But Sean Darcy reportedly back maybe as soon as next week, uh, as reported by Ryan Daniels, the WA Journal. Frio, just stick with Jacko in the ruck. That's all I'll say. That's all I'll say uh, because he's, he's a joy to watch. And I think he had something ridiculous like 90, it was like high 97% disposal efficiency or something as well from, you know, low 20 or disposal. So crazy, crazy stuff. But he is the good. He is the great. He is the great. Now let's let's bring the mood down. Some bad. <laughs> um, uh, Hayden Young. I don't think anyone would be too surprised to see this bloke here. Uh, bulk midfield minutes didn't equate to strong scoring uh, from Young with too many turnovers yet again costing him valuable points. A 62 uh, this week and a 70 last week to start the season definitely hurts all owners. And I think he'll find himself on the block, on the chopping block for most teams this week. Yep, I uh, totally agree. And uh, it hurts as well to say because we were both pretty big. I mean, so I was I was – Pretty big on him. I thought he was going to take the next step. He's that age group, um, sort of that 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 games bracket as well uh, in terms of experience. For him to take the next step, has the role that he had in the back end of last year that we saw um, his average jump up to you know in those isolated games to you know 105, 110 odd, um, and just hasn't returned dividends uh, due to he's got the role. He just can't kick. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to see. But the other thing that was hard to see is the man that's in the ugly this week. Little Nicky, a.k.a. Nick Dacos, scored just a 54. A 54 against St Kilda. Simply putrid, Nicky. What are you doing, mate? And I know he was like kind of, it was blanketed to some extent by Win Hager and St Kilda as a whole, but it was more so like looking at his game, he was just off completely. He was overrunning the ball. And there was a couple of moments as well where he just withdrew from the contest that sort of stuff. And it was Don't just talk like, about it. what do you do? I know exactly. Contestable, They'll come that for sort of you. stuff. They will come for us. <laughs> no, not us. But, I didn't, oh, I, have not said, I have not said a bad thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> yet. Exactly right. Yeah. You know, I thought that was going to slide through the keeper there. You're just like, yes, yes, yes. I'll own it collectively. Like us people. Yeah. Us, <laughs> yeah. Us people. They're going to come for us people. No, those people are going to come for <laughs> me individually. You people, you know who you are. The correct use of you people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, so they won't come for me for other reasons other than than being Collingwood supporters. But, yeah, he was was just putrid and just was off his game. And I think it was one of his lowest games since he's he's been playing at senior level. So, And it was his 50th game as well. So what a way to mark your 50th game, Nicky Dacos. Pull your socks up and just be better. Just be better. I have saying. nothing left to add to that. Are you sure? Are you sure you don't want to add something, Lou? No. You, you how bad was up. he? Let me know how bad he was so those people enough. can come for you, for you. I VC'd him. Like, what a waste. Mm, I it as well. What a waste. Seriously. Anyway, I don't want to talk about it. Like, I could have had, I don't even know who was on my bench, actually, to say I could have had that score on instead of him. <laughs> but seriously I, I could have had a, a, a dnp i could have had a did I not had, play i could have had marty hall scoring 12 and i would have been happier with that than a 54 from nick dacos yeah it's like the expectations it's like with nicky dacos anything less than 100 is like what are you doing but like to be almost half that score it's like like if he went 90 i would have been like yeah all right yeah bit yeah, of an off like, game off game, yeah. but like 54. That's like he went out. It's like he hopped out into the field with like one leg mm. type stuff. Like still be able to score 54. You've been subbed off. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just pull your socks up. That's all we'll say. Um, and you people can um, just keep them at bay. They'll, they'll be in agreement anyway. Just remember Damon's, Damon's, Damon's handle is at DamonJ88. <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure that's my handle? <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's move on, of course, um, to the next segment, the old favourite. Round three is fast approaching, so this is probably the most important part of this episode and the most important, the price is right. Show me the money. <laughs> the price is wrong, bitch. 
For those tuning in for the first time, The Price is Right is the segment where we discuss potential trades and trade targets from week to week and even discuss whether a specific player, whether they should even be traded at all or you should uh, Hmm. wait or hold or whatever it is. Yes, and uh, before we kick things off, for those that tuned in last week, you'd have heard us mentioning the worrying trend. It was, it was said jokingly, and I said it was kind of like a bit of final destination. It was like the you know the the super coach gods, um, you know, picking off players, and it was this trend that we identified mm. with those players that have sustained substantial injuries, having all had the common link of being injury riddled players. So we had Gipkiss, Reed, Doherty, Coleman. And off the back of that, we forecasted jokingly perhaps that the super coach Reaper was going to target others in coming weeks that are injury prone and used Fife and Yo as examples. And here's the clip um, just for reference here. Thinking back to round zero, who are the two guys that did their ACL? Doherty. Doherty. Kitty, Kitty Coleman. Both guys who also mm. have had really bad injury histories and Doc with his obviously yeah. uh, health battles off field as well. So mm, I think there's, point. Been a bit, there's a bit of a link here. And I'm going to put it down to the the super coach and generally football gods. Pull your heads in. That's just yeah. ab- absolutely cruel. So hopefully it doesn't continue with any other injury rebel pl- rubbish players mm. like a Nat Fife or a Elliot Yo, for example. And well, Liam, the super coach Reaper has struck again, of course, with Coffield going down with a shoulder injury. And in the lead up to the Frio game, we did uh, we we pulled out we dusted off the old. Crystal ball, the old super coach edge patent to crystal ball. We gazed ever so longly into it and outlined the likelihood of five being sub due to playing the most minutes in the engine room for seasons back in round one. And of course, his subbing came to pass. But more than that, JL in his press outlined that Fife reported back tightness in game, which contributed to him being subbed. This is happening. It's all coming to fruition. So wait and see. Just a big watch on the Fife, of course. Yeah, we outlined it. We said it was going to happen. Of course, must admit that like Jaeger Amira being like the starting sub was kind of a bit of a dead giveaway Yeah, about potentially Fife being managing game, but didn't foresee the back tightness. The the super coach Reaper did. Yo, is he next? Maybe. Who knows? We'll release it next week. Crossing this list off. There are no accidents, no coincidences, no mishaps, and no escapes. I'll see you soon. This, the Supercoach Reaper is really just, mm. I don't know, not good. feel bad for, obviously, uh, injury and old Caulfield going down again with a yeah. shoulder injury, as you mentioned. Um, and again, it's another defend, defensive cash cow um, after Gib, Kiss and Reed. Yes, as we mentioned, Caulfield going down, he will headline our segment of going, going, gone. So let's get straight into it. Yes, Nick Caulfield, as we mentioned, is... Uh, the next in line of injury riddled players to go down injured, this time hurting his shoulder in a spoiling attempt. Unfortunately, he has been ruled out for 12 to 13 weeks. So our hands are forced, especially for those still holding on to Reed or Gimkes potentially as well, mm. if, you've, if you've still got him. And there was quite a few players with him still in the side. Yeah, 61% of teams, Nick Hoffield. Yeah. So yeah. I'd be trading him out. Or using him as a, I mean, you could use him as a loophole if you really want, considering there's not much, not much great yeah, stuff to be going to in the defensive line. But we'll chat about that a bit later. Absolutely. And uh, I was fortunate as well because didn't have him, was waiting to see how he fared uh, in this game before I committed. And um, yeah, just fortuitous for me uh, in that case there. Um, so if you avoided him, you're probably in the similar boat there. But Let's move to on the chopping block and uh, headlining here. We have Charlie Lazaro has a break even negative, negative five. And I guess it's kind of a bit of on the fence here, hence on the chopping block. Had 53% CBAs last week. And this round he had just 14%. But as we flagged last week, he held the potential to be a sub candidate, which came to fruition on the weekend. Scored a 66, which isn't half bad, but it makes you wonder how stable his spot is in the team, not only as a future sub candidate, but also inside the best 22. So is he still inside the best 22? What we saw in the preseason looked pretty good, but you know things move, things change. Um, so Makes us wonder, but you could opt to hold him if you prefer, if he is named, but watch to see whether or not he can, of course, hold that spot heading into round three. I agree entirely. I got out of him, got out of him. I traded him last week. Um, As did I. Just didn't have good feelings and kind of saw upside in other players. 
yeah. um, that I could get in uh, in his place. Next up, let's chat about Nick Martin, break even of 123. And there seems to be a bit of a common theme with Nick Martin. There's no doubting he can find the ball with 25 disposals last week and 31 again this week. But where are the points that come with it? With 63 and 93 in his last two weeks, there is some doubt over his scoring ceiling. Does he need bulk disposals like Tom Mitchell uh, to score well? Five clangers obviously hurt his score. So is he a hold or a fold? especially with a jack steal within reach. You could hold the faith and hope he turns it around like Fisher did on the weekend or even hold out for one more week. And if he falters yet again, look to flip him to potentially a Flanders off his buy. Yeah, I think it's a 50-50 for me. I'm I'm probably going to trade him just because his 123 break even is high. Mm. Now, I obviously watched the game against Sydney. I thought he played okay. I was a bit surprised he had 31. Um, mm. disposals, if I'm honest, from watching the game. But I I don't know, I struggle watching the game on TV and sort of getting that concept of how they're lining up and how the play unfolds, especially with uh, the game filmed uh, record, uh, broadcast from the SCG and they don't have any oh. concept of zooming out. The camera positioning is the worst of all time. Just think back to uh, Buddy Franklin kicking his oh milestone God, goal. Someone believe. jumping up in front of the camera. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Seriously. But even just, oh, sorry, this is a complete tangent now. But like <laughs> One of many, when the ball's near them on the boundary line, so they cut to the, the, the camera on, on the ground and you're like, this is the worst shot. Like this is not yeah. useful for anything. You can't see what's happening. Like anyway. Yeah, Sorry. it doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> anyway, back to Nick Martin. The other thing that I know I'm going to – we keep harping back to this, but the preseason score showed that he can score well. I think he had 27 disposals in that game off the top of my head or 23. Mm. It was around the 25, but it wasn't 25. It was either two more or two less. I can't remember off the top of my head. So it shows that he doesn't need to have bulk possessions like a Tom, a Tom Mitchell, but his kicking efficiency or his disposal efficiency is what's hurting with his turnovers. I do wonder whether he's got in his own head a little bit playing in that position and mm. needs to get out of it. I'm probably going to move him on purely because I think with the break even of 123, I'm a little bit concerned he's going to drop in price, potentially pick him up a bit later when he's got DPP status as well, if he's mm. looking better. But also mm. I think I can target other players and make my side stronger and this yeah. is the week to do it. I'm going to be a bit more bold in my strategy. I think than I would normally. Bit of a sneak peek here to my team talk for those people who haven't um, tuned into it, but I'm kind of, I, I did say in that that I was keen to move him on to, I would have loved to have brought in Jack Steele, but I just can't afford him. Uh, that would be mm. my ideal move. Uh, my secondary move was potentially getting in a Matt Crouch. And just because I think maybe he can make around about 50, 60, 70 K thereabouts and then flip him. But then thinking about that further, and it's like, well, that's virtually going to cost me two trades, obviously bringing Crouch in and then trading him out to, you know, another genuine primo. So I'm kind of like almost, I've done a bit of a 360 because I'm kind of like, okay, well, maybe I should keep him and wait until Flanders comes off his buy. And I'd much prefer to have Flanders in my team who no doubt is a keeper compared to a Matt Crouch um, and go down that route. And it saves me an extra trade uh, compared to if I had Crouch and then having to flip him. So there's that. And then there's also, I thought, okay, well, who are the Dons playing this week? And it's St Kilda, is that correct? Mm. Who traditionally, uh, well, last year anyway, gave up some bog points to defenders and, uh, you know, dashing defenders slash wing, wingmen. So, and a game at Marvel. Like yeah, and a game at Marvel. Be, yeah, it's going to ping around. So off the back of that, I'm thinking, well, Maybe everything's sort of pointing towards holding him for a week and maybe even longer than that. But I think just maybe if it is an isolated thing where I can sort of make the most of the matchup um, and then I flick him to um, to Flanders, I'd be even happy to do that. So I'm kind of still on the fence, but uh, I can see both sides of the argument in flipping him if there's better oh, prospects or holding yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah, I think it comes down to who you're flipping him to. If you're mm. like... I can't, I mean, I'm not going to go through every option, but if you're going for a steal, I like yep. that. A Flanders next week, if you can do that, is nice as well. Um, I'm looking at our trade-in options. I don't know. There's some players where I think it makes sense, and there's others where you're just mm. going to leave bulk points 
It's just, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's the thing. I think you're just going to think about who you're trading him to um, and make sure that it's not just too short-sighted. Make sure yeah. you're doing it for the right. Like you said, a Matt Crouch, like if you're trading him out to a Matt Crouch who you don't really see as a keeper, mm. then you're really using a trade to get to Matt Crouch and then you're going to be trading Matt Crouch out. So it's really three trades to mm. upgrade him. Whereas a Jack Steele, I think, can finish top 10. Yeah. If not top. 12. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like as low as, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I can see yeah. him, like, I think he's, I don't think Steel yeah. will finish that out that far, that far outside it, that it's going to hurt you. Yeah. Whereas a Matt Crouch could. And the thing is as well, like for those wingman defenders, like just providing a bit of context. And this is uh, the last three games of 2023, as well as the first two games of this year. Um, St. Kilda have a positive uh, differential with the points that they give away to yeah. opposition wingman slash defenders. So, um, I think he uh, there's there's yeah off off that sort of matchup discussion. I think there's reason enough to hold him, um, and yeah, it comes down to this week. If you need to make moves, like now's the time to do it before price changes. Obviously, so you've kind of got to, as you said, take a risk um, and uh, yeah, go from there. Uh, for me, my risk is holding him potentially and hoping he doesn't drop too much in cash. But at least I've got some cash in the bank. Um, to switch him to a Flanders um, yep. if things falter badly. But let's move on to the next guy, and it is Hayden Young. Uh, we spoke of, of course, already. He has a whopping break even of 165 and put in a bigger stinker than his 70 in round one, believe it or not, with a score of just 62. But uh, I guess the upside, which we spoke about across the entire preseason for Young, is his role. Yeah. And he actually had more CBAs in the weekend compared to round one with 72% up from 59%. And he did show very nice signs of the preseason, of course, but can he clean up his disposal, which is virtually the only thing that's holding him back at the moment, with eight direct turnovers on the weekend, adding to his 11 in round one for a crazy total of 19 across the first two rounds of the season. So the role is there, but he's just really holding himself back. So whilst he might turn it around, can we afford to wait considering his break even is now that 165 and is projected to potentially lose 40K on the weekend? I reckon he's going to turn it around personally. I think he will uh, because the role is there and it's just a matter of time before he does turn it around. But it just makes me wonder as well. It's kind of like I liken it to uh, short from Richmond, you know, yeah. playing in defense, having that, uh, that, that, you know, part of his game where when he has time on his side, he can hit up teammates, all that sort of stuff, use his fancy foot skills. But then when he went into the midfield and got put under pressure, he was turning the ball over on mass. And that's very similar to what's happened to Hayden Young here. Um, but again, he showed some good signs of the preseason. So it's not as if it's every single time he's played in the midfield and even the back end of last year, as we saw, he was scoring pretty well. So there's enough of a sample size there to say that these two games are outliers. Um, but nonetheless, I think with the break even at 165 um, and with, you know, on the cusp of, of um, price changes, might be a good time to move him on. And then if we need to bite the bullet, swallow our pride and bring him in later in the season, so be it. So I'm just having a quick look at his games to end the season. So his disposal efficiency when he was playing that midfield role he still was going quite well so 89 84 mm. 76 did have a 68 which did give him a 69 in terms of his score a super coach score ding ding and yep. that was his down game the others were sorry it's really hard to look at this so round 20 he played geelong that was the 69 uh the score of 69 and a disposal efficiency of 68 76 percent um against the lions he scored 123 84 percent against uh, the Eagles, 118, and then 89% disposal efficiency for 113. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, sorry, one more, 73% for 111. Whereas this year he's had 67 for a 70, which aligns quite well with his 68 and 77 from last, last season. And the 76, sorry, the 70, he had 76% on the weekend for a score of 62. So mm. it does show that he can score well when he's kicking it well. And it, I don't think, I think what I'm trying to say there is it's not necessarily, it's, it seems a bit like a Nick Martin almost style yeah. issue where he's disposed of the is what hurting him as opposed to the ability to find the ball. Cause he still yep. had, 
He's had 24 and 20, oh, 21 is not great, but not, not terrible. Um, but good CBA is good role, uh, but just not hitting targets, unfortunately. Yeah. And just having a quick look as well, like just using uh, the last two games of the season uh, for Hayden Young, just talking in terms of direct turnovers in mm. round 23, uh, he had 19 disposals and zero turnovers uh, for 89% disposal efficiency, which I think he spoke of. And then the last game of the season, he ended up having uh, the, uh, what's that, 22 disposals and only three turnovers. So, and and, and like those games as well, seven tackles, um, yeah. seven tackles again, that kind of should sort of offset it. And like, again, round one this year, 10 and tackles. tackles. That should... Like that should, should offset a, it massively. Yeah. So it's yeah. I think there's there's enough signs there to say that he will turn it around. I think, but yeah, it's just with the break even. I think like if you have a chance now to flip him to a genuine primo uh, that's killing it, it kind of makes sense with the extra yeah. trades we've got as well. If you haven't burned too many already for silly uh, moves, and you've got like all the cash cows that you want to jump on or need to jump on, I think yes, you could probably afford to move him on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just I think he will turn it around, and I'm I'm totally banking on having to use another trade to bring him back in potentially. But being a midfielder defender, there's enough guys there to say that you know there's others that are going to be finishing inside the top six. There's Stewart, Dacos, Sheasel, Wang and Miller are potentially uh, Sicily, Houston, um, Ryan. So Powell. there's there's quite a few yep. Powell. Yeah, there's quite a few guys there already, which. Would sort of he might be in a bit of a bottleneck type situation where yeah. he's scoring well enough, but not quite to be averaging high enough to be a top six defender. Yeah, um, and not and enough I mean, to be midfielder. It's also interesting looking at his last two weeks. He's gone at zero point zero point six six points per minute. So mm. that's considerably down on what he was doing when he was in the midfield last year, which was yeah. basically double that at you know one point two one point one eight. 1.28, 1.12. So yeah. his time on ground, yeah, isn't really low, 77 and 78, but just the his ability to make points. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. I tend to agree. I think I'm probably moving him on, but I think you've got to just weigh it up in context of your entire side. Agreed. Moving on to Alex Sexton, break even of minus six. And it may sound strange putting up a bloke with that, break even of minus six on the block, but there is a good reason. The first is that he is on the bye this week. So if you're in the camp of having too many Gold Coast or Greater Western Sydney players in your team, that may see you roll with less than 18, and that is reason enough. The other reason is that, I guess reading the tea leaves slightly, relates to him having been reverted back to a bit of a forward role in game on the weekend that looked awfully concerning mm. as it all but dried up his scoring and with it his cash-making potential. This is too eerily similar to Himmelberg of recent seasons and mm. could put an abrupt halt to his role as a quick-fire cash cow and instead a very slow burn rookie. I think, uh, did it happen to Sheasel as well a couple of games last year? I think it did, yeah. Yeah, just that, just that vibe, you know, like you know, yeah. from, from that halfback to obviously Sheasel didn't affect Sheasel as much because he obviously get put back, um, but just it just kills the cash gen. It's it's hard, isn't it? Because it's kind of like it's it's the same thing as well. It's kind of like well, you could potentially get rid of him this week because next week, like you're kind of losing losing out on him being able to play anyway. So he's not going to be making any cash. So they're not you trade him now or trade him after. You know, this weekend's game, you're going to be in the same position. So um, if you need someone to move on, I think it kind of makes sense. It's just it, it think, kind of it's, it is annoying, isn't it? Yeah. I think if you're holding him this week, you've got to hold him for two weeks. Mm, potentially, because, yeah. Because, yeah. like, realistically, what's the point of trading him next week? He hasn't played a game. He hasn't made an extra cash. Okay, for the projected, he's still got cash to make with the minus six break even. Mm. But realistically, you're probably looking at another 50K maybe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, if that, Just especially if he's averaging around about the 50 to 60 mark. Yeah, like his break even. So, for instance, plays GWS next in round four with a minus six break even. With a score of 47, he goes up another 24K. And then, yeah, he kind of peaks, I guess, at around round seven at around 238K. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you're making another... 
fifty odd k. So it it could be worth holding him. Yeah, it's just a risk. I think it comes if you're going to hold him, you've got to hold him for another few weeks. If you're going to trade him, I mean, you can just do it now. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. Uh, he's currently the fourth most traded out player, as we record this as well, with 4.6% of owners uh, trading him out. So there you go. Uh, people are kind of supporting that notion of, of uh, getting rid of him early yeah. uh, because maybe they don't have any other cash cows they need to correct. Kind of makes sense. But uh, I guess in terms of looking forward to next week, uh, in our weight category, um, those players to wait for, of course, there are a couple here, uh, one being Sam Darcy, uh, just quickly, so he was absolutely elite, um, showed what he's capable of, kicked two goals, uh, was actually supporting English in the ruck as well. Um, an absolute gun. Bevo looked at himself in the mirror, surely, and was like, I'm a dickhead. Why did I start lob? Should have should have listened to to you know to Liam and Damo uh, on the Supercoach Ed podcast because lob's no good. Uh, just plain and simple. And Sam Darcy is an absolute gun. Um, so, yeah, he ended up scoring the 109 and should be someone to look at bringing in next week. Uh, then we had Josh Draper as well, 123.9K as well. Didn't score as well. Um, he's probably more of a genuine uh, key position defender for Frio. Scored a 35 on debut, but as you know, with Frio's injuries in defense, his job security is going to be skyrocketing. So uh, look for him as well uh, heading into next week. Yep, agreed. Now let's move on to the players to get and get them in. So these are the guys that you need to trade into your side this week. Or ones you should consider at the very least. Yeah. Uh, first up, we've got Massimo D'Ambrosio, break even of minus 82. Very, very juicy. Led mm. the way with uh, for the Hawks with 39 disposals for 122 in that first round. Um, and then butted up with a 23 disposal game, eight marks and 87 points on the weekend against nice. Melbourne. This does see him. We have a break even of minus 82 and in line to make another 64.6 K according to super coach plus with a score of 59. Ooh. So yes, with virtually <laughs> no quality defensive rookies on offer due to injury, D'Ambrosio's standing as a trading option is elevated further. Solid job security and will make us bulk cash all the while being a solid on field scorer. Yeah, I'd get him in. Just be mindful. Obviously, that 122 is going to drop out after this week. Mm. So we need another big score, hopefully, so they can stick around for another three weeks. Yeah, exactly right. That would be super handy. But we'll make us uh, first up, as you said, that uh, big, big price jump. expect at least um, 64K, yeah. Yeah, and that's with the projected score, as you said, of 59. So he should he should trump that quite easily. So, um, yeah, it could be in the realms of 70, 75K upwards. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the next uh, get them in candidate, and it is Tommy Powell from North Melbourne uh, with a break even of negative 47. So this bloke is probably what we were all hoping Lazaro would be, busting out scores mm-hmm. of 95 and 129. And the most impressive part of his game is his role, being gifted 76% CBAs in round one, which then increased to a whopping 93% on the weekend, which was the most for North Melbourne, believe it or not, ahead of LDU with 83% and Wardlaw with 72%. Has a knack for finding the footy with 26 and 28 disposals across his first two games, so looks to have well and truly taken that next step in his game in his fourth season. Uh, He is someone that I am very, very keen on. And mm. I endorse, by and large, everyone should be getting on um, because he's going to be making us a fair chunk of coin, isn't he? He is. He is. Reminds me of, sorry, not Will Powell, Will Brody. Oh. oh, yes. In that sense of like just option that potentially if he can, if these trends continue, uh, he could be <laughs> a he could be a top forward. Um, obviously, it's a long season. Um, yeah. So I'm not going to suggest that at this stage of two games, um, but definitely bulk cash to be made. There should be one that you consider getting in if you can, especially if he's getting CBAs like that. Yeah, that's a very good comparison, actually. Will Brody, I like that. Um, yeah, midfielder uh, as, yeah. A, as a forward, going to get obviously DPP as well, come round six, uh, give us some added mm. flexibility, but uh, will potentially make us 60 K first up with a projected score of 80, which uh, if he scores anything like his first two games could be up towards the 65, 70 K mm. mark uh, as well. Like D'Ambrosio uh, first up, which then uh, his second price rise in round four, they've got him projected for 34 K. Uh, if he scores more than what he's projected to this weekend, his break even goes down even further, which 
they've got at one at the moment in round four. We'll go into the negatives and he could potentially make us 100K or close Ooh. to it over the first two weeks of his price rises. So I think he should be up there, if not top of the list, uh, for those people looking to bring someone in. Uh, a bit pricier, but uh, I think he's worth it. Agreed. Next up, Jack Steele. Uh, break even of 61 with his first two games of the season, returning scores of 119 and 120. It would appear the steel of old is back to full fitness and form. Birdman. Uh, <laughs> most notably, his strong tackling game has never been better with 17 across two games, which included 11 from the weekend. I think it was like five in the first quarter or something as well. It was nuts. Yeah. Could he once again be a top eight averaging mid as he was in 2020 and 2021? You know what it is, Liam? He's just virtually displaying to you because he knew. No. Obviously, we all know what's going to happen. I'm going to trade him in and he's going to do his no. collarbone. And then Ross the boss will be like, no, nah, he hasn't done a collarbone. <laughs> Gonna be out there in a sling. Yeah, and, loses an arm. <laughs> and he's gonna be like, no, he's fine. He's not injured. Yeah, he's not missing an arm. But but Ross, we can see there's a stump there. He's clearly lost his arm. No, no, he hasn't. But you know what it's gonna be like? I think maybe 2024 is the season of, you know, it's the kiss and makeup season. Like I started with Isaac Heaney. And it's a bit of a love affair now, I must admit. I'm a bit of a fan of, of the old boy, um, excluding, of course, Nat Fife. He, he's, he's in the burn book permanently because he's burnt us that many times. But I think this is this is the, the season for rekindling the Supercoach romance, Liam. He was in my side, I'll say. was in my trade options. I've got to, I've got to re-look at them because these were yeah. very Sunday night uh, range oh, yes. trades. Uh, <laughs> so I need to look at my side again. Operating uh, solid was, logic, of course. Yeah, of course. At yeah. two o'clock in the morning uh, <laughs> on Sunday mor- uh, Monday morning. No, I'll have to check whether I bring him in, but I do like him. I think he's a good option. Underpriced. I actually don't know what his price is off the top of my head, but it was five something. Uh, there was a five at the start of it, which means that he's very <laughs> underpriced, if you ask me. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, should be in the 600Ks. He's actually, yeah, he's priced at 529.5K. So that is very, very Bally. juicy. Almost yeah. as good as Took Miller. Not quite as good, but almost as good. Yeah, exactly right. But it's to do with the, you know, all these tackles that he's doing, Liam, as well. He's trying to appeal to you and you alone with the cuddles. He's like, I just want to cuddle Liam. Give him a cuddle, rekindle the Supercoach romance, and make up, and that's that's it. And you'll just sell off into the sunset together. We'll see. I'd rather <laughs> get on. The, I'd rather get on the next best thing in Tom Powell. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. That's true. That's true. He's the uh, yeah the the next. He's the junior Jack Steele potentially. Mm. Um, but let's move on to uh, Lukey Jackson, and uh, he's got a break even of just 19. So after scoring a whopping 113 and a 178 in his first two as, we'll call him King Dick, in the ruck, it makes his starting price of 547k an absolute bargain. His game in the weekend was near perfect with 24 disposals, three marks, five tackles, 21 hitouts, and two goals at an insane, as I said earlier, I've got the stat here, 96% disposal efficiency. 96% from 24 disposals. This bloke can do it all. Absolute silk. So, you know, I think the only thing that's going to stop him from here, of course, as we've spoken about ad nauseum, is the return of Hodada, uh, who's almost through the door, Sean Darcy, who is projected to return in round four, according to WA Journal Ryan Daniels, as we mentioned. But surely, surely, Liam, Frio, don't change a good thing and just play Darcy forward more. Flip, flip it on his head, you know, Give, give Darcy the 30% ruck time. Ease him back to the game as well. Like that's another reason as well. Returning to fitness, mm-hmm. play more forward, allow Jacko to do his thing. And he was like, I, I, this is not just speaking in terms of uh, uh, just buttering him up, but he was part of the reason why Frio turned around their form in game because mm-hmm. they were down by 20 odd points or thereabouts against North Melbourne, turned it around in game, killed it off the back of Luke Jackson. So nonetheless, that's all I'll say about Luke Jackson. We know the risks potentially of his score being impacted with the return of Darcy, but I'm holding out hope, Liam. I reckon you just put Sean Darcy out to pasture. Exactly. They've like, just re-signed seriously. him. What are they doing? I just don't <laughs> get it. I, I honestly don't. I don't understand. I mean, maybe I'm discounting the importance of a Ruckman, but like... 
It's like Gordon Grundy like, all over again. Yeah, but I just feel like a Jackson makes more sense. Like he's he's like versatile. He's a new like age rugby. He, he does do, it all. Yeah, exactly. I just again, maybe I just haven't watched enough Fremantle games to see the appeal of Sean Darcy. That's beside the point, though. Yeah. Um, I the only issue I have for Luke Jackson for people trading in Luke Jackson is that Darcy is seemingly only a round or two away, mm. so it's a big price to pay. I think if you started him. 100% you're not trading him. Um, you'd be keeping him in. Um, and that might save him as a top forward because you've got those big scores in the bank already. Whereas yeah. if Darcy comes in and he regresses a bit, it's going to hurt the people that trade him in from now on more than it's going to hurt the people that trade it, that have had him in from the start. Um, so I am mindful of that. I'd be less bullish on trading in a Luke Jackson, but that's yep. head talking because – I'm thinking Darcy's coming back. And mm. I think there's a natural it's, progression in Jackson's game, though, that's going to see him increase his scoring just because yeah. he's sort of age. He is projected as well to go up 81K, uh, <laughs> according to Supercoach Plus, if he scores a 128 this coming weekend and then a 100 in round four against Carlton. So um, you could almost take the risk on him, maybe ride him as a bit of a playing Please. cash cow. Who does he play this week? Uh, Adelaide uh, at Optus mm. Stadium, so home deck. But then he travels uh, back-to-back games against – that's not right, surely. Oh, no, it is Adelaide Oval. I was going to say Adelaide Oval against Carlton, but it is uh, gather round. And then they're sticking there. So maybe off the back of that as well because surely they're not going to fly back to Perth and then fly back to Adelaide again. So they're going to stay there in Adelaide, round four against Carlton, and then round five they're playing Port Adelaide at Adelaide Oval again. So if he doesn't play round four, surely he doesn't play round five. Two interstate games, they're not going to fly him over just for the um, game against Port. Do they be conservative with him? I don't know. It's all, all guessing game with uh, with Hodador. Mm, I don't like it. I don't yeah. know. It just feels risky, but maybe it's yeah. worth it. It might be worth it. And you know what? you got to do what you want to do. It is risky. I want to say I wouldn't do it, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be real. Um, I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. Luke yeah. Ryan, his teammate, break even at 54. With Young firmly in the crosshairs of many, many coaches, Ryan presents as one potential target that the many have labelled even a likely top six defender. I think he finished top six last year as well. Um, so it does have the pedigree, I guess, uh, mm. in that sense. Uh, sounds good in theory, but it is going to cost you 86000 odd in order to make the switch. His scoring has been very impressive with 165 and 127 in his last first two games, taking bulk kick-ins too as a bonus. The only question is whether he switched to playing a more accountable lockdown role at times, given Frio's lack of quality in defence due to their recent injuries. It's just, it's it's the up, it's the jump up, I think, is the hard thing to get to find yeah. 86K. It's a lot of money without any price changes as yet, apart yeah. from those players, of course, that played in round zero. But even then, like one price range, one price change at this stage. Yeah, which isn't going to bridge the gap between you know, 80 odd K. So, um, yeah, it's going to be hard to try and do it. But uh, for other trade corrections, you could maybe loosen up the cash yeah. if you're getting in some, you know, bottom priced type rookies that you've missed, um, which we'll get into in a moment uh, for or those in the bubble. Potentially but- it could be worth going on Nick Martin down to a D'Ambrosio to get up to a yeah um, get Jackson up and you'll have plenty of cash left. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say I'd tick it off necessarily because yeah. I feel like it's risky in a lot of ways. Or DPPs like Nick Martin down to uh, Powell, for example. Yeah. Flipping a, a forward play into your midfield and then yeah. using That's that cash to. That's probably a bit better with that one. Yeah, something like that, which I did. I did actually consider myself doing, but um, yeah, uh, yeah. There's, there's ways around it if you want to do it, yeah. and I've seen many people try and and do it with you know activating the boosts and whatnot. You can do it in the the two trades there, as I've just said. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm just more of a fan of if you have the chance to get in two underpriced guys or guys that I think. Mm. Um, again, giving secrets away from my um, uh, from my team talk video, but like. I have the chance of going for like Ryan by himself or going for Wanganin Miller and going for, 
you know, uh, potentially Flanders, um, that sort of thing. So mm. two guys that I think a potential chance of finishing top six in both of their positions, um, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's up to you how you want to structure your team this early on because, yeah, he might be sort of hard to reach even more so once he uh, jumps up in price, no doubt. And I think focus on your cash gen as well. So don't mm. – it's a hard one because obviously you're going to have Young dropping in price. Like, let's be real. What's he – his break even was what 164 or something, wasn't it? Yeah. 165. So he's going to drop in cash. So you do need to factor that in, you know, Nick Martin, 126 break, 123 break even, sorry. He's going to drop in cash. Mm. Like it's hard, but you do need to make sure you've got the right rookies. Cause that's where you're going to be able to make your bank um, to make upgrades later. So just don't, I guess, sideways trade in a sense. Yeah. Um, at the detriment of making sure you've got enough cash or cash cows or the right cash cows. Yeah. Do recall as well, like Ryan started the season on fire last year, 171, 122, 105 and 111 went up 40 odd K to 578 and then ended up having a score of 93. And then he started to drop and then a couple of scores where he was 85, 84 and a 91 Ooh. and dropped down to virtually starting price. So I think there's a chance there that maybe that happens again. It comes down to matchups and stuff as well, I think. But yeah, it's going to be um, interesting to see those people that jump on him, um, well, and if he can sustain his 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 uh, output. Well, looking at matchups, Adelaide give away the second least points to designated kick in players. Yeah, well, and the Carlton's next up after that. Carlton, it's a positive, but kind of not really like fourth or fifth. Yeah. Um, most points. Uh, so then, and in terms of also general defenders, Adelaide give away um, probably the fourth most, fifth most, something like that. Sorry, fifth yeah. least. So again, it's a hard matchup against Adelaide potentially for old mate Luke Ryan. Yeah. And, and I think he's going to probably yeah. have his hands full, like with Charlie Curnow and Harry Mackay. Yeah. I think they're going to need all hands on deck there. Um, Especially with their defensive those. boys. Yeah. Yeah. So I reckon they might have to use him as a bit of a double team type operator or, you know, I, I don't know who they've got. They would kind of like, like Harry mm. Mackay, the more sort of traditional full forward, whereas Charlie kind of needs someone versatile to run with him. Mm. Um, so, you know, double teaming Harry Mackay, having someone, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it happens, but I think there will be a week there where, he will score a bit lower than what's anticipated yeah. and his score will start to drop. So I'm not worried uh, at all at the moment. Uh, it'd be nice to have him in, but um, yeah. I wouldn't it's, move heaven and earth to get him in this week. No, no way. No way. There's yep. others that I would do that for. Keep it up your sleeve for team talk. Mm. <laughs> I don't know who actually, I, I said that and I don't know who it actually would be, <laughs> but um, there's others. Yeah, there are, there are others. There are, there are you, you, you people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That is good to play in your team. Um, but let's round it out with, of course, uh, Wanganeen Miller, uh, break even of 48. So early stage of the season and Wanganeen Miller is already putting his hand up as a potential top six averaging defender and taking the next step in his game, mm. backing up his score of 101 in round one with a 120 point performance in round two, which came from 32 disposals and 11 marks. Um this game as well, I don't know if you watched much of it, Liam, but uh, he was incredible. Like when we're talking like silky foot skills, mm. he is next level, like pinpointing passes, even 45 degree kicks into the middle of the ground, like stuff that you wouldn't really want to take a bite of as a, as a normal player, but he's got yeah. that skill set, the confidence to do it. Looked really good, run and carry, intercept marks. He, he just was doing it all. Could be a nice downgrade option for those keen to move on young. And with it, it also nets you close to 50K as well as a bit of a bonus. So um, could help you in terms of other sort of sideways moves or upgrades uh, over the next sort of few weeks. Yep, agreed. Don't mind it. Uh, moving on to the next guy. Uh, sorry, to the next category, and it is on the bubble, and these are the rookies who are on the bubble. They're about yep. to have their price rise this coming week after this match. So ones you need to get in if you are considering them. Uh, to bank on that. So let's kick off with the first guy, and it is Jack Carroll with a break-even of minus 69. And ding, ding. Carroll, <laughs> he returns <laughs> off the bye, still on the bubble, 
with a break even, as I said, of nine is sixty nine, and a projected price rise of fifty two thousand if he can score forty three, according to Supercoach Plus. We've already spoken about his solid job security given the season ending ACL to Doherty, so he will get every opportunity to impress. And he has done just that in the first two games of 2024. Picking with confidence as a solid cash cow should push the 100K price rise over the next three, you'd expect. That's it. Uh, I've got him already. Uh, Ken endorse getting on him because, yep, job security, uh, scoring output equals uh, bulk cash. So yes. jump on him. Uh, next up, we have Toby Pink, uh, the pinky. Uh, with a break even of negative 32, he's priced at 123.9K, scored a 58 in a solid performance in round two, and looks to be the last cash cow standing really in defense following the injuries to Gipkus, Reed, and now Caulfield. Looks to be a slow burn rookie, however, as we've outlined previously, but could also provide cover across the best 18 early bye weeks mm. uh, as a bit of a, I guess, a little bonus there. But um, yeah, as we said, he's probably not going to give you too much output, um, but 58, not too bad in his second outing, must be said. Yeah, agreed. Um, next guy is Ollie Dempsey, break even of minus 71, 148.4K. He has been a surprise packet of the early cash cows, scoring 96 and 59 in his opening two games. And according to Supercoach Plus, stands to make 60K if he can score 61 on the weekend. Keep in mind the 96 score is largely propping up his first big price rise and it will fall out of his scoring rotation after this week. But nonetheless, could be in line to make 120K over the next three weeks if he can pop out a similar score to that of round one. Just be wary of the fact rookie spots are at a premium in the forwards. So if you do go for Dempsey, can you still afford to a spot for potentially, you know, Sam Darcy next week? Um, and obviously priced at 148.4K, so it's not quite an easy trade necessarily. Totally agree there. Uh, I do like the look of him, though. Looks really, really good. You've got him, haven't you, Liam? I do. I do. Yep. No, he's a, he's a super player. And I'm just, I'm just worried. I'm just worried about the Scott factor. Um, but I'm still looking at him, I must admit. But let's move on to Jeremy Sharp with a break even of negative 63. He's priced at 123.9K. Has scored well enough for someone at his price point. Mm. with a 70 and 63 to start the season. Looks to have very solid job security also, which is a bonus, and could make upwards of 100K over the next three weeks, much like uh, a couple that we spoke of already, if he can maintain his current average of 66. I like it. I like it. And, of course, this should go without saying, but Sanders minus 37 and McKercher minus 68. We've spoken about these guys ad nauseum. So if you haven't started them for some reason, you make them a priority as they have insane yeah. scoring capacity and the job security to go with it, but we'll assume everyone has them, so we're not going to chat about them anymore. Yep, 100%. Get them in if you haven't got them. If uh, you're missing this week, the ship has sailed. But Liam, now is the time for me to wheel over and get my trusty old hat. And you know what? Instead of us saying it, Liam, as we uh, we put the call out last week, we had someone, a certain special someone, send in their rendition of the name of this segment. Mm -hmm which is, take it away, Adam. Look at me. I'm the Capitan now. Toot, toot. Well, very good. How's about that yes, from Adam? Loving it. Loving the little toot toot as well. <laughs> just going the next step as well. Just incredible. And he did say, he was like, I didn't even realize I did it. It's just like, I've heard it so many times that it's just ingrained <laughs> into his brain. And it's like a second nature thing. I was like going real deep there. Yeah. <laughs> You just it shows deep how deep super coach edge law. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And how deep into his psyche that we have delved. Like yes. we've virtually been transcending down into his uh, subconscious. Um, yeah, so incredible uh rendition there, Adam. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that. And again, the call out does uh exist from here on out for anyone tuning in. Send us in your I'm the Captain Now renditions via uh Facebook, email as well. Uh, AFL Supercoach Edge at gmail.com. If I got that yep. correct, Liam, uh, so. email it to us, send it through to us via Discord, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and we will have you uh, featured in one of our upcoming episodes. So thank you again, Adam. But mm -hmm. Liam, I'm the captain now. For those people tuning in for the first time, what is it? Speak to yourself, but yeah. Um, we chat about VC and C options in case you didn't know. Virtually it. That's, That's it. it. That's it. <laughs> We've scrounged through all the data. 
Oh, yes, of course. We've done yes. the hard work for you. Yes. And we've found the top three options that we think you should consider for this week. Yep. I like it. Well, uh, first up, we have Nikki Dacos. We're gonna Nikki. we're gonna sort of forgive him. We're gonna forgive him. Because nah. uh, he's he's got a bit of a pedigree. Cut him? Okay. Should have been in on the block. Should have been should have been on the block, exactly on the chopping block. Um well Nikki Dacos. So he does face Brisbane this week, first up, first game of the round. Put in a rare stinker in round two, of course, as we spoke about. And whilst it was partly due to getting attention from Winhager, it seemed like he was just having an off game. So stay of execution here. He has scored 151 and 71 in his only two games against the Lions. And in the first game of the round, could be an easy VC. But again, was it last week just a case of, you know, the Thursday night curse striking? Mm. Will it strike again? We'll just have to wait and see. But uh, he is no doubt someone that you could put the VC on. Yeah, agreed. Um, Another guy we can consider is Tim English up against West Coast. If last round's game wasn't juicy enough with a late out forcing poor Ned Moyle to battle one out against the big English breakfast, then round three is even juicier. This week he faces the depleted ruck. Mm. The ruck line. Just West Coast. The ruck line that just West Coast, uh, what is it? The green... An animal, an sorry, covered, an rod. covered rod. Exactly. Exactly right. And I think this is probably the, like, because I think West Coast, they played Barnett, who was kind of the fill-in ruck as well, mm. um, BJ Williams as well. So, yeah, and they both struggled. So you're going to need, like, every part of your arsenal to combat Tim English. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he kind of speaks for itself, doesn't he? Yep, I like it. Well, you, you actually own him, Liam, as well. So... As an owner yourself, is he in calculations for you? He He's is. He's got 138 on the weekend against yeah, Edmund. Nah, definitely is. The issue that I'm going to have is I also like Marcus Bontempelli in that same game. Mm, yep. um, and there's no one really to VC after, sorry, to see after that in my side because you've only got the two games after that, Richmond versus Sydney and Hawthorne mm. versus Geelong. So I don't really like anyone in my sides from those guys. So, yeah, I wish to find someone early game. But talking about the last option, Damon, who is it? It is that man you just referred to in Marcus Lebont. Is he Le Capton? Uh, he faces, of course, West Coast, uh, as you know, alongside Tim English. Need we say more, really? Went 136 against the Suns and faces the Eagles, who have given up 137 points against Tom Green on the weekend, just gone. And his last three games against the Eagles read as 162, a 96, and a 145. Was the 96 because he went and ducked off to the loo at like, you know, during one of the quarters? And he actually went down to defense and uh, the ball didn't get down there for the, for the Eagles. <laughs> that would have made sense. But I must say as well, like he had a couple of niggles, or at least scares. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he had the ankle, uh, which twisted underneath him in a tackle, and we thought, oh, no, please. Don't be bont in the next line of, um, you know, uh, I guess write-offs uh, mm. due to the super coach Reaper getting around the league. But then had his knee looked at as well. But uh, by all reports, all good. And against West Coast, surely he can go out there with one leg, one arm, and uh, still score 162. So Le Bont is in the line for El Capitano, Thank you which is that. a bit of a segue <laughs> onto our captaincy head-to-heads. So uh, I continued my winning trend with a selection of Green, uh, scoring 137, eclipsing your selection of Gorn for 113. So that puts me on the board. And, of course, the differential is at the moment a 24-point difference. Mm. So, uh, Liam, you get the first choice this time around, and it's an added layer of difficulty with some of the big dogs in a buy, namely Green, of course. Who are you rolling with this round? English breakfast, because I'm actually probably going to see him. Yep. I like it. And that totally makes sense. If I had English, uh, I would be doing the same as well. Um, but uh, I'm not going to put the faith in little Nikki this time around. No, nah, you've done your dash, mate. Bont Le Bont is le, El Capitano uh, yeah. for me. <laughs> uh, for me this round, I think. So it's going to be uh, the two dogs up against each other. Mm. Who's going who's gonna to come out as the top dog, Liam? Oh, there we go. <laughs> 
Well, uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, um, yes, Liam, that does bring us to the end of what has been a mammoth show, of course. Hopefully it's been comprehensive enough for those people tuning in, for those uh, ever important decisions that have to be made before price changes, of course. But before we go, Liam, where can our listeners and viewers find us across our socials? Yes, on YouTube, search Supercoach Edge and please don't forget to like and subscribe. On Twitter, you'll find us at, at Supercoach underscore Edge. David at, at DamoJ88, especially for all those people that want to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> beat me to it. You beat me to it. I was going to say, make sure you hit up that at Liam Evans underscore 95. No, no. Remember, remember who you said those mean things about Nick Dacos, not me. Um, you can find tricks. myself at, at Liam Evans underscore 95. Damon does believe that Nick Jacos doesn't know what a contested possession is, so please. <laughs> I did not say that. I do. Th- what I will say is that the definition of a contested possession needs to be changed because if you're just picking the ball up from the ground, that's contested. Apparently. I do agree with that. That any, is. That any, is. And that's ridiculous. Shit. That's not a criticism of him. No. With that, that's no, a criticism of champion data. Champion, champion um, data. Because mm, I agree, he can't classify it loose ball get as a contested possession like it's it's makes no sense yeah anyway facebook yeah. instagram tiktok search <laughs> supercoach edge and you'll find us there yep of course and um make sure of course to check out our team talk review episodes and mm. don't forget also to jump into our free open league if you haven't done so already with the league code being yes. one two three three nine one with of course the uh the winner receiving a super coach championship ring from the uh, the absolute legends from the uh, Supercoach Championship rings. Mm. Well, Liam, that rounds us out for round two as we head into round three. So best of luck to all of you out there. May your trades hit the mark and your scores head to the moon. Catch you next week. See you guys. Bye.